I always think of that LBJ line when he was introduced at Baylor College. He said that uh, my father would have uh, enjoyed it, my mother would have believed it. So uh, I wish my mom were here to hear that. <laughs> um, well, thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be here, and um, particularly I'm interested in the students who are here. How many, who, who are students here at the school? Particularly pleased because A, you're not getting credit for this, and you're not getting fed. So as a former dean, I know it's really hard to get students to show up for a non-credit, non-food providing event. So it's very good that you're here. And um, coming here today may remind me of when I first met Bill Clinton. Uh, and it was Martin Luther King weekend, 1992. And I went to hear him speak. And I remember coming home that night. And he only declared his candidacy in uh, October of the previous year. And I came home and I said to my partner, um, I just met the next president of the United States. I was totally convinced, and I was uh, just blown away that night. And I went to work for him in 92. I went to work again in 96. I had the honor of serving in the Clinton administration the second term at the Small Business Administration. And I also remember coming here and uh, want to acknowledge uh, Skip for his great work on the library. I remember coming for the opening of the library in 2004. I don't think I've ever seen more rain than I did that day in November of 2004. And I learned something that I have never forgotten as a result of that trip, and that is I never ever took a trip again with one pair of shoes because I went from here to New Orleans and they never dried out. So even on this trip, I've got a second pair of shoes in my suitcase because I said I'm never going to take a trip again with one pair of shoes. They may never dry out again. Um, but I, will, I do want to say it was a, a, a great pleasure working with Larry. Um, Larry and I, as he said, saw eye to eye on so many things, and so clearly when it talks about what, what I'm going to speak a little bit about, about jobs, about the U.S. economy, about competition, uh, there was no daylight between Larry and me. And uh, I think, when I think about what Larry said, you know, we could all find common ground if we just work on it. There's a common ground. And there's something that, frankly, I think about that Bill Clinton always talked about was finding common ground. And uh, I wanted to just say a word or two about Skip, because when I visited this library, and I was recently at some other exhibits like this, and I was overseas in Europe, I was at the Design Museum and so forth, and I always think and remember vividly the library here, how it makes history so come to life. And so let's give Skip a round of applause. <laughs> Now, I always like to talk to students. Um, as uh, both Skip and Larry mentioned, I had been dean at the new school in New York, School of Management Urban Policy. So it's very good to be on campus. And one of the reasons I like talking to students is um, you will ask challenging, tough, and I'm hopefully impolite questions. Now, um, so I'm counting on that. Um, of course, there's also Congress who I'll be testifying next week. They sometimes ask impolite questions also, but that's a different story. And that's on the record. Um, but this is a school of public service, and um, that's why I really wanted to come and speak here, because particularly the students in this room and frankly the community at large, we have an opportunity if we think about how we're going to enhance and how we're going to engage in the global economy. Um, it's going to take people both in the public sector and the private sector, and it could mean both. And I worked in a small family business for 20 odd years. Then I worked in the private sector, then worked at the university, and now I'm back uh, in the public sector again, uh, working for President Obama. And it's important that we have more people who have worked in both the public and private sector, Larry is a very good example of that, that bring that perspective back and forth. And that, I think that's, that's what makes for a much more healthy uh, economy and makes us such a global leader. Uh, and it is in the public sphere that policy is shaped, and it's where the rules of the road are written, and it will determine for, partly how America is going to engage in the global economy in the years ahead. And I will explain that in a moment. So again, those of you who are here at the Clinton School, um, clearly you are considering public service, and um, one of the things I, I, when I think about that is that our economy needs to engage far more in the global economy. 
Uh, that's why I'm actually here in Little Rock and talking to companies here in Little Rock about how they better engage in the global economy, how they can both export more goods and services and create more jobs here at home. And for those of you, particularly the students, again, we, there is a program in the federal government called the President's, President's Management Fellows, PMFs. Um, we actually hire two or four PMFs each and every year at the, at the Exim Bank, and we actually did when I was at the SBA. So that is actually at pmf.gov. So if you're not familiar with that program, it is really a great program. We take people who, within two years, are going to graduate school, and they get a two-year appointment in the federal government, uh, need to work at least in one other agency, and frequently, if they want to, are then hired in in a permanent way. We've hired many people uh, in various departments of the bank, small business, transportation, CFO, have all come through that PMF program. So that's my pitch for you to join the federal government and to, and to consider that uh, when you finish here at the Clinton School. Um, <clears throat> because what we're talking about and what I'm here to talk about is the economy that the students at the school are going to both inherit and shape because this is going to be the world you're going to be living in. This is going to be the businesses you're going to be running. This will be the kind of families that you and your children will occupy. So clearly, you want to have a hand in shaping that. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at the Export Input Bank because that is a lot has to do with our commercial engagement with the rest of the world. The global middle class is going to grow by about 200 million people each year for the next five years. 200 million people. 200 million people is the adult population in the United States. 200 million, that is a lot of people entering the middle class. And what, that, what the middle class means globally means people who have more money than basic food and shelter. People who actually would like to make sure they have electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, things we take for granted in terms of a balanced diet, transportation, medical services, um, the kinds of things that we export, the kinds of things that we export to the rest of the world, power plants, satellite communications, consumer goods, all those things. So as more people enter the middle class, that provides a lot more opportunities for American companies, and as a result, a lot more good paying jobs here in the United States. So what's important is that we don't sit that, sit that out, that we actually have a hand in writing the rules of the road. It's one of the reasons why uh, President Obama and this administration is putting so much importance on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. If we don't write the rules of the road, other people will. If we don't have a hand in how trade is shaped and financed, other people will. And if other people do it, we're probably, the rules are not go are gonna be stacked in all likelihood against us. So, that's why this is important, and that's why it's important for people in public policy to engage in that. Now, I'm curious how many people, I'd like you to raise your hand, if you actually heard of the Exim Bank before you decided to come to this lecture. I want you to be really brave. Well, that's pretty good. Even Kelly Kemp, who works for the bank, didn't raise his hand. <laughs> Kelly Kemp is here with us from our Houston office. Um, so we are the official export credit agency of the United States. We work with companies large and small, mostly small, and equip them with the financing they need to win global sales. And a lot of companies use products um, uh, which we call credit insurance. I visited a company earlier today called PowerTech, right here in Little Rock. Just like companies get fire insurance, theft insurance, in case there's a fire or a theft, many people get what they call export credit insurance. It actually provides if your customer overseas doesn't pay, we write insurance policy on it. We also provide working capital so that it's sometimes if you need working capital to assemble the inventory and, and financial business while you're waiting to get paid by a foreign customer. And lastly, sometimes buyers need financing. We're competing so in many countries, the banking system is not as deep. We will guarantee a loan so they can buy the U.S. goods. All of this is in service of U.S. jobs. So, and a lot of times, this is also uh, sales in the developing world, in particular, as I mentioned, where financing is much more difficult. We want to make sure, when companies are exporting, that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a foreign competitor on things such as quality, price, value, innovation, delivery, 
and not have financing be the, the stumbling block why they lose in order to a foreign competitor. Um, we produce, as I, I believe, some of the highest quality goods and services. I think with a level playing field, we win our fair share. We're not going to win every order, but we're certainly going to win our fair share of orders. And those jobs are important jobs because if they're not created here in the United States, they're going to be created someplace else. Those goods and services are going to be bought and sold and delivered, and I think we all prefer that they, those jobs be jobs here in our country. So let me give you a couple of examples. I was um, just in Chicago last week and actually saw this company. Anybody here from Chicago? All right. There's a little company in Wicker Park called, run by a woman named Mary Howe. She is a fourth generation, was started by a great grandfather. And um, particularly if we're here, if you enjoy fresh fish, uh, Mary's company makes something called flake ice machines. So if you go to a Whole Foods or a, or a local supermarket and there's that bed of ice that the fish sits on, her company makes that ice. I learned more about ice making that morning than I ever thought you could imagine. And when the recession hit in 2007, 2008, uh, domestic sales slowed down. She, although she'd been exporting since the 1930s, she said, if I'm gonna keep my employees, if I'm not gonna have a layoff, I need to start exporting much more aggressively. Insurance companies, to ensure those overseas sales, were not interested. The company was too small. Sales were not large enough. Um, and she said, I've gotta sell more to those 95% of the customers who live outside of our borders if I'm gonna keep my company growing. So, you know, it's one thing if you sell to, if you're here in Arkansas, you're in Chicago, and you sell to a customer in Iowa or Indiana, if they don't pay, you know how to collect. But if they're 5,000 miles away, it's a lot harder to collect, particularly if it's a smaller order, $10,000, $20,000. So we provided for a fee insurance. She gets credit insurance for customers overseas. And as a result, she had the confidence to keep selling overseas and Keep her, keep her employees. Exports are now 40% of this company's business. And this is a little company. This company does $10 million a year. You know, Mary said to me, particularly, and this is true in many family business, she said, I like to hire people. I like to keep people. I don't like to fire people. People help me build my business. I, it pains me if I have to let them go. I'm gonna, I wanted to pursue sales, if anything, to keep my workforce intact. And I have found that over and over again in company after company, particularly small businesses, are interested in keeping, keeping their employees employed is, is, an important, is, is, is almost as important as the profit motivation they have. So we also do that obviously here in, in Arkansas. There's a company we do business with called BCH. They're in Hot Springs. When they came to us in 1998, there were four employees at this company. Uh, they'd hardly heard about Exim Bank. We provide them with a working capital guarantee. So they get working capital that they can actually create the inventory to ship overseas. They now sell to Europe, Japan, the Mideast. They have gone from 0% exports to 100% exports. They're 100% exports, they do about $10 million a year, and they have 50 people working for them. Another company actually Larry was involved with, a company called LM Wind Power, we passed it right out here. It's a Danish company. They produce wind turbine blades. You're all familiar with them. Um, we partly attract companies that come to America because this is a good place to do business, a good place to export, and then we finance their exports overseas. All right, so I've told you about a little company in Chicago, a little lumber company here in Arkansas. When, what does this have to do with the global economy? So let me tell you. Uh, when I went to college, we had Cliff Notes. People remember Cliff Notes? I'm going to give you a fast Cliff Notes version of, of global trade. So. In, in 2002, not long ago, we were the largest exporting country in the entire world. Nobody exported more goods and services in the United States. 2002. 2002, Germany passed us. We fell to second place. 2010, China passed Germany. We fell to third place. Now, we have moved up. We moved back up to second place. President Obama launched the National Export Initiative. More companies are focused on it. Companies here in Arkansas, companies in Chicago, more businesses are looking at overseas markets. And we moved to second place. And frankly, I don't believe there's any reason we can't be in first place again. There's no reason we can't be in first place. The German economy, 
52% of that economy is exports. China, between 27 and 30 percent. Korea, 57 percent of that economy is exports. Great Britain, we all love to go visit Great Britain. They don't make a lot of things in Great Britain. 30 percent of that economy is export. In the United States, we are at an all-time high. We have never exported more goods and services, and we are just under 14 percent. Never been higher. Do you know who we're tied with? We're tied with Haiti and Rwanda. That's our peer group, <laughs> Haiti and Rwanda. And we've never done better. So we are in the global order, we are 144th in export sales. Just think if we moved exports to 15 or 16 percent, balance of trade gets in order, we put more people to work, export jobs pay better. Um, it's a little bit like, for those of us to think about, it's like diet and exercise a little less eating and a little more exercise and we get into shape a lot faster. A little more exporting and perhaps a little less importing, we can, our economy gets really to hum. So what do we need to do that? Well, we need to, one, focus on exports. We need more companies exporting. We need more trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We need better infrastructure. And frankly, I believe we also need a stronger export input bank. Today, there are 59 other export credit agencies just like us around the world. 59, we are not alone. Russia, China, and countries like that frequently offer financing that is unmatched by the United States, unmatched in the commercial markets. They are so aggressive and are not accountable that frequently things like quality and value get pushed aside in, in light of financing. When China comes to the table to sell goods, Financing is always part of the package. And it's a very attractive financing package that becomes integral to making that sale. When I met, I was in uh, South Africa last uh, July, and I met with uh, a customer who bought from South Africa, they bought locomotives. They split half the orders in the United States, half went to China. Two things I learned. One, a funny coincidence happened one month before the bids were opened. China made a $5 billion loan to the rail authority for system upgrades. And what a funny coincidence. China got half the order 30 days later. Not only that, when China came to the table to finance that order, they were told, the customer, I asked the customer, what are the financing terms? Like any good businessman, I want to make sure that we're competitive. They said, oh, China said very clearly, what, what do we need? 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, do we need a grace period? Tell us what you need, and we can make the financing work. So I think American companies, in that case it was General Electric, can compete with any locomotive manufacturer in the world. They can't compete with China Inc. That's stacking the deck too far. That makes for an unlevel playing field. Let me give you a number. Well, it's a big number, $600 billion. $600 billion, that is the total amount of loans, guarantees, and insurance we have done since 1934 when we got started. In the last two years, since 2012, China has done $670 billion in two years. And frankly, that's a low estimate because they are not, it's not, that is not the most transparent economy and banking system. I think the number, from my estimates, is closer to a trillion dollars. In two years, it took us 80 years to get to $600 million. So we have a lot of competition out there. I don't, and I think American companies, I was with Caterpillar this morning, I was with a company called Powertech. We can compete with anybody, but we cannot necessarily have companies trying to compete with countries. So that is one of the dilemmas we have. We have to make sure, whether it comes to trade agreements or Exim Bank, that we provide a level playing field for, for U.S. companies. That's why the Trans-Pacific Partnership is important. That's why TTIP, which is, has to do with the trade agreement we're looking to uh, work out with our partners in Europe, are very key to job growth. Last year, we supported 164,000 jobs. Larry mentioned the 1.3. Last year alone, 164,000 jobs. Let me put that in bite-sized terms. That's about 500 jobs every single day of the year. That's a lot of jobs. That's a lot of communities. That's a lot of businesses. When I was at Powertech this morning, he said to me, well, if we weren't exporting, we'd have eight or 10 less people 
and they've got this new product. We, they hope to add about 18 people in the next three years. That's not just 18 jobs. That's 18 families. That's a lot of people kept in their home, kids going to school. These are real numbers about real people really having a transformative effect on their lives. Now, we do this at no cost to the taxpayer. We collect fees, points like points on a mortgage. Um, we get revenue. We put aside loan loss reserves, like any good financial institution. Congress allows us to appropriate so we can keep about $100 million to run it. And what's left over, think about when you're in business, you have sales minus cost. I want to ask the students, what's left over? Profit? OK. Problem is, we don't have the word profit in the federal budget. So what do we call it? It's called negative subsidy. See, because the government subsidizes the thing, so when money goes the other way, it's called negative subsidy. It's like, it reminds me, when you go to the doctor, and the doctor says to you, everything's negative, and you realize that's a good thing. So negative subsidy is a good thing. It means we took in more money than they actually put aside for loan loss reserves and staff. Last year, $675 million we wired to the Treasury. $675 million went to the Treasury for deficit reduction to you, the taxpayers. So we actually make a profit. Uh, I like that number so much, it's also the password on my iPhone. Just don't tell anybody. Um, so what we need is we need to make sure we have some certainty. Because small business owners, entrepreneurs face a lot of uncertainty when they're selling overseas. The Exim Bank provides some level of certainty to those transactions. Um, so we would like, I think we all can agree, we'd like those jobs here the United States, not in China, not Korea, not in Japan. They can create their own jobs. We want to create those jobs here at home. Um, coming here today, I thought a little bit about because a week ago, today, uh, yesterday, I was at the Kennedy Institute of the Senate in Boston, and uh, there were many speeches there, and it was a, a similar to the Clinton Library. It really helps teach people about public engagement and, and public policy, and um, uh, President Obama said a few things, and I wanted to just repeat them because I thought about it, particularly coming to a school today. And the president said, President Obama said, quote, we can fight on almost anything, everything, but we can come together on some things, and those some things can mean everything to a whole lot of people. President Obama talked about how Ted Kennedy worked with Orrin Hatch to deliver health care to kids, talked about how Ch Senator Kennedy and Chuck Grassley worked together to uh, help children with disabilities, how the senator worked with Pete Domenici to help those with mental illness. And it went on and on about a number of things where people crossed the aisle to find common ground. The way Larry and I talked about, the way President Clinton talked about. And I thought about when he said that, and I thought, you know, the Exxon Bank is one of those things, one of those some things that people can disagree on everything, but still come together and agree. So I think that uh, I'm proud to be part of this administration. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can get some students from the Clinton School to come join us in, in Washington and join us at the Exxon Bank, because I think we can make a difference in the global economy. I think we can make a difference in how we engage with the rest of the world. And importantly, we can create a lot more good jobs here at home, a lot of good jobs here in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. So thank you, Skip. Thank you for inviting me. And I think we have some time for questions. All right, if you would raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you. Abby? Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm a Clinton School student, Abigail from China. <laughs> I have three questions, actually. Great. For, oh, my uh, <laughs> first is, um, you mentioned that uh, U.S. want to develop the small business uh, itself. So, do you have any idea about uh, which market you want to develop for uh, small business in the U.S., like other developing countries or developed countries? You know, so many developing countries want to sell sell out their good to the U.S. So the second question is, um, what you think it is the most challenge for small business in the U.S. to, um, I mean, bacterial sort of thing, because we heard that um, labor is expensive in the U.S. sort of thing. Other developing countries also cost much 
to uh, have competition for the global market. So for the US, what's a big challenge? And the third one is um, about free market. You know, like Apple company, uh, they pick up their supply chain in other developing countries. And I heard that uh, each one Apple iPhone, uh, its uh, pre uh, private rate is over 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, 90%. Uh, profits. Oh, profits. Profits, sorry. <laughs> profits. So they, uh, maybe because of cheap supply chain from uh, developing countries, so if they want to develop supply chain in the US, maybe it's not the free market's choice. So how do you think? Okay. Well, I'm gonna, that's a lot of questions in one. I'm going to see if I can remember them. 90% um, of our customers, as I said, are small business. Um, Frequently, they're selling, I mean, the small business is pretty much more across the globe. Uh, a lot of them start in places like Canada and Mexico. It's certainly easier. They're right here. If I was advising somebody where, where I'd start, I would start there. Uh, frankly, the, we, the U U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce and the Commercial Service has an office here in Little Rock. I don't know if we have anybody here from there. They're actually the best advice because depending on your product, they can help companies find the best market for that particular product. So the Com Commerce Department is really their goal, their job is to sort of do the matchmaking. Our job is really the financing side of it. And a week ago, I know Lee Zak was here, and she also, her job is to sort of do feasibility studies and find out where there are opportunities. So we'll have slightly different roles. Um, in terms of cost, um, I think that, you know, we have a lot of advantages in America from a manufacturing point of view, from rule of law, lower, lower energy costs. We'd like our infrastructure to be better, but frankly, it's still better than a lot of the world. So this is a pretty good place to do business. LM right here in Little Rock is a good example of that. We have company after company that have come from overseas to manufacture here, not just to sell here, but to export from here. Um, supply chains, I think companies go, you know, cost is a factor in a supply chain, but reliability and deliverability, those are also important factors. So it's, I, it's not really just about cost. Yes, sir, Ramirez. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Ramirez Biddle. I'm a second year Clinton student, and thank you for taking the time to visit and speaking with us. Uh, my two questions to you, sir. Um, I've been studying a lot of international and U.S. foreign policy because I think that's the strength that I need to really build up. And I'm seeing that economics in the 21st century will be as important as military power was in the 20th century. So how can the United States maintain global economic leadership while working with, uh, while working as partners uh, with developing countries. Uh, what policies would you like to see come out of the Congress or hasn't been implemented yet? And then my second question is, I'm very interested in, 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 uh, in economics, obviously, but I'm interested in, in, in public service banking. I don't know if that's a term yet or not, but, I, but I'm interested in that to use finance and business in the market to reduce poverty because I believe, I firmly believe that poverty is the greatest tax on an economy um, that, that an economy can face and we haven't done a very good job of reducing poverty in the United States. Uh, let me try. Um, actually, um, Secretary Clinton used the term economic statecraft and I think that was partly an acknowledgement that our commercial ties are exceedingly important if we're going to have better relations around the world and a, strong, and a more national security. So um, clearly, countries that build things together, countries that make things together, if we build roads or airports or other things together and our people work with each other, that forms much more durable bonds than almost anything else. So I think the commercial part is important and that's why I'm excited by the work I can do at the Exim Bank because we're connecting American companies, American workers with, with projects overseas, and we're building greater understanding. Um, I also agree with you, you know, social justice is also about economic justice and economic opportunity, and I think that um, when we do work, uh, small businesses, for example, frequently have a much harder time getting access to banking and financial institutions. 
Uh, one of the goals we have is to do more with minority and women-owned businesses at the Exim Bank. Uh, last year, we, we financed the export of about $27 billion. Two billion of that was from women and minority-owned businesses, a large portion. So part of it is, is making sure that when we a more globalized economy, as we try and increase exports, we want to make sure that small businesses are much a part of that and minority and women-owned businesses are. I'll give you one other stat. In the last six years, we've done more loans at the Exim Bank and guarantees for minority and women-owned businesses in six years than all of President Bush and all of President Clinton combined. So in six years, we've done more than the previous 16 years. So we, um, that's a real focus on us to make sure that people are part of this global economy because we don't want to leave anybody behind in that regard if they have the interest in the business acumen to do so. Yes, sir, right here. Okay. Go, yeah, right there. How do you deal with the uh, problem that many companies have in the United States in trade barriers in the sense of uh, high tax rates on our exports when some co countries can export to the United States and only pay a fraction of that tax rate. Do you work with the State Department or any other federal agency to try and get some parity on those rates? Uh, well, the short answer is no. Uh, that's out of our, sort of out of our lane, but I think I can say that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, that's designed, A, we have the most open economy in the world. And I think one of the things we have to understand is forming these trade agreements across the world, as President Clinton did with a free trade agreement with Canada and Mexico, is essentially to open those markets to us. Our markets are pretty open to begin with. The tax issue, you know, is a far more complicated issue right now and um, outside of my expertise. But we, you know, we need, President Obama's acknowledged, I was in business for 20 years, we need to address our tax system. It's far too complicated. And it's, it, what we need, that needs to be addressed so we don't provide a disincentive to doing business here. Hey, thank you for being here. My name is Austin Harrison. I am a first year Clinton School student, uh, second year law student. And my question is more domestic policy and how it affects our exporting. Recently, there's been a push to increase minimum wage around the country. It was just passed recently in Arkansas. For small businesses in particular, it's, it's difficult to increase that wage and maintain the workforce. How will an increased minimum wage affect small biz businesses' ability to export in the future? Well, I'll give you one example. Uh, there's a company, uh, I wor we work with in Florida that does exporting of uh, medical technology, uh, medical surgical sutures. And, um, uh, he was, I'll give you an example, he was concerned about the health care law, you know, how many employees he had. So what he, he said, well, I'm going to make sure I, I put some more automation in. So he was able to automate, actually didn't need as many employees. But you know what happened? He brought his costs down, his sales went up, and he's wound up, he hired all those people back and more. So I, I think it's similar with a minimum wage. At, at a minimum wage, one, we need to give people working a, a, a wage to live on and even President proposed ten dollars and ten cents. It'd be very hard for any of us to live on ten dollars and ten cents an hour. It will force us, and we're pretty good at it in this country, about being more innovative. We will find innovative ways of working, innovative ways of manufacturing, innovative ways of dealing with it. It may mean more automation. It may mean other things. But I actually, I ran a business for twenty years. We never paid minimum wage. We always paid more than minimum wage, and I think. I think it's, uh, it's not my area, but you know, I think we're about creating jobs and we need to be creating better paying jobs. That minimum wage, when I was in college, I had a minimum wage job working at, at the university. I made like three and a quarter an hour. That was 40 years ago, um, more than 40 years ago. The fact that it's gone from three and a quarter to seven and a quarter nationally our inflation's gone far more than that. So I don't think we just don't have people keeping up. But again, um, but minimum wage is not really my expertise. That's a personal view. Yes, sir. 
Hi, I'm Nathan Watson, and I'm a first year student at the Clinton School. Um, you discussed that there is a growing middle class globally. Um, obviously, in the United States, we want to see that same trend here. Uh, for a state that is rural and uh, with lots of poverty like Arkansas, what kinds of, um, what kind of skills, what kind of workforce demographics can we grow or focus on in order to uh, take advantage of that growing middle class? Well, I think we do, I think you do a lot of that here. I mean, you know, a company I mentioned that BCH Lumber is one company that's a, selling essentially a farm product, Timber. Um, Power Technologies, a company I visited this morning that's in the laser area. So, um, you know, we actually, when it comes to, we talk about being an agriculture state, we actually run a surplus. We export more agricultural products than we import. We run a trade surplus in, in agriculture and commodities. We run a trade surplus in, ser in services. The place we run a deficit is actually manufactured goods. So one, state after state can do very well in terms of exporting. Two, I think, you know, obviously, the companies I visited today are selling more high-tech products Lasers is one example. So we need people who are, one, skilled in math and, math and sciences. But uh, I remember what someone told me years ago when he says, what do I look for an employee? I look for people who can add and subtract and know right from wrong. So frankly, if you can add and subtract and know right from wrong, you're what most businesses will need, in my opinion. Dave. Yes, I know, I know there's a lot of places you could be on a Tuesday night, but thank you for being in Little Rock. I appreciate it. Um, as the, it's not raining. <laughs> yeah. As the, um, the debate over reauthorization um, heats up in Washington, um, there's a lot of uh, focus on the image of Export-Import Bank, and I know um, a lot of your pitch was about small business. Um, but for somebody who is skeptical of or opposed to reauthorization, like myself, um, those people would point to the fact that in terms of raw dollars, uh, the vast majority of financing goes to a very small number of very large companies, Boeing, GE, Caterpillar, John Deere, et cetera. Um, and the Mercatus, Institute, or the Mercatus uh, Center at George Mason Said, says, for instance, in 2013 that the top 10 recipients of XM financing were very large companies that ac accounted for 76% of that financing. What do you say to people who have that concern as opposed to uh, small businesses? Well, as I said, 90% of our customers are small businesses, you know, uh, so that's a large percentage. You know, if you're selling a Boeing airplane, those big ones, they sell for 150, 175, 180 million dollars. Um, power technology sells a laser equipment for 30 or 40 thousand dollars. We've got to sell a lot of laser equipment to equal one airplane. So is it a surprise that some of the larger, more costly exports, you know, when we do a satellite, they're expensive. Um, what we have to recognize is if we want to sell capital goods, if we want to sell locomotives, satellite equipment, power equipment, airplanes, it's a global market. Whether we like it or not, we are competing. For, if you're the Boeing company, you're competing with Airbus. Airbus is backed by the government of France, Germany, and Britain. They will finance their sales. We, all we want to do is make sure there's a level playing field. I don't, I don't want to send a U.S. company into a competitive situation where they are outmatched, outflanked, and having to compete, as I mentioned, with a foreign government. We ought to make sure that we, want to, we can compete, and American companies have no trouble competing on quality, value, innovation, delivery, but they can't compete against whole countries. So we want to make sure there's a level playing field. You know, I'll give you an example, uh, and I was in business. Business people prefer not to work with government. Um, we do less loans today, far less than we did two years ago. Why? Because the commercial markets are, are stronger. When the commercial markets are there, we're going to step in to make sure that our companies and those jobs keep being created here, not being created abroad. But if, the, if the, we're dealing with certain parts of the world, two-thirds of our loans are in developing economies, there isn't the financing there. So we have to make a decision. 
if we want to compete, if we want to sell those kind of goods and we want to create those kind of jobs, that's what it's going to take. So that's the, that's the question. We can't just wish it away. It's, it's magical thinking to think that, well, this will just happen. It won't happen. It will, it will happen. We'll all be flying on Airbus planes. We'll all be sitting in Komatsu tractors. And we'll all have our power plants run by Mitsubishi and Siemens. That's, I don't think that's a pretty picture. So um, I, we, we do business with people who come to us because they need our financing. If they, that's who comes to us. We don't go and seek them out. If they need our financing, we want to make sure there's a level playing field because we really care about the jobs we're creating. The jobs I talked about at Power Technology earlier today, that's what I'm worried about. Yes, right here. Yes, Brian. What is the demand for the bank services in Arkansas, and how does it compare with five years ago? We, um, we are, we, our exports that we have financed in Arkansas are about double what it was in, in 2007, uh, about $770 million. Um, it's, been a very, it's been a pretty diverse economy from agriculture goods like lumber to renewable energy. Um, our exports have been a little slower in the last year, although we've hit a new high of just over $2.3 trillion nationally. Exports are up about 3% from a previous year. So frankly, right now, we have a little bit of headwind globally in terms of just global trade. The global economy has slowed down a little bit. Uh, commodities are off. So I think some of those things are going to have an impact for, for some time. I still remain very optimistic. I think that we... Again, when I meet American companies, we've got the kind of products and services. We do a lot in service exports uh, that make us very competitive globally. But we also need to make sure we've got those tools that we can compete on a level playing field. Esperanza Masana with the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. Um, as you work with many other states, how does Arkansas compare on a competitive, from a competitive standpoint what is your perception? I think we are pretty much aware of our advantages and disadvantages as well as opportunities and challenges, but from your perspective, where do we stand and what are some of the things that we can improve in a business climate to attract and retain uh, these type of companies in the state? Well, it's a good question. I'm sorry Larry left because uh, Larry ran economic development at one point in the state and uh, he told me that the, Governor Hutchison is bringing in a new economic development person to really focus on how we grow those economies. You know, we have something we call a city-state partnership. Uh, we have a partner here, I think, in Arkansas, right here. Want to stand? And just shout out your... Yeah. So we work with city-state partners like the World Trade Center here in Arkansas to make sure that we've got someone who locally understands the local economy and can bring the tools that we provide uh, and supplement them with things that are done here in Arkansas, supplement them with the Small Business Administration or the Commerce Department. Um, I think what's good about this particular economy, and I saw it today, is it is everything from mining equipment to high-tech um, products and the lasers I saw to agricultural products to renewable energy. So it's, a, it, it's not solely in one sector of the economy, and that actually makes for a much stronger export profile. Um, and my sense is from being here and, and the companies we work with is it's, this state is very much looking outward and looking at global markets and is not just looking at selling within its own trading area or the states around it. So my sense is it's, it's, it's pretty well positioned. Yes, 